Yeah, thank you very much, Karin, for, for giving me the opportunity. It's really close to my heart to, to be here and to have this webinar. I'm, I'm really excited that, um, that we have a, a nice program today and, and uh, foresee very interesting scientific talks, but, but also have two winners uh, of prizes. And for, for all of us who are in neuroscience, uh, the question, why, so to say, why certain factors act on the brain and how do they do it and, and how they are related to function. This is an everyday work, of course. Um, but uh, when it comes to, to sex and gender differences, it is not so easy uh, to, so to say, to understand this dimension of diversity. And we have several challenges. One is, for example, that we cannot simply translate from research from animal, uh, from experimental animals to the human brain, obviously not. And, and uh, secondly, I mean, sometimes these factors uh, are not really strong, but, but rather weak and uh, more, more difficult even. They, they are interacting with, with several other factors. Uh, and these factors are not only related uh, to the biology, I would say, but, but also these are sociological factors, uh, psychological at least, and, um, and so to say, to, to really understand what, what is, so to say, happening um, and, and how to best describe uh, sex and gender differences. Uh, th this is a, a challenging research question. And I should say, so a couple of years ago, I would say 20 years ago, it was um, um, yeah, most often the case that the functional imaging study approached uh, 20 uh, male subjects, 25 years, maybe university students, which is not really a reflection of the broad uh, intersubject variability and of the variety. Uh, of people and, and also not of brains. And, and many, many things have been changed, uh, fortunately. And we are now in a much better situation. And one of the, the people who was really a driving force, I would say, from, from the very beginning and, and, he, uh, and who very systematically analyzed uh, sex and gender differences on the brain and uh, has uh, uh, today also a strong focus on um, functional plasticity of the human brain. Um, that is that is Professor Lutz Jenke from uh, from from Zurich, and um, he is uh, one of the most highly visible, um, I would say, psychologists and neuroscientists uh, in this field. He has made numerous studies using functional magnetic resonance imaging, electroencephalography, but also. Uh, introduced fundamentals of MR morphometry. He had very popular papers uh, on, on musicians, uh, but all, the, all these papers were methodically very strong and uh, they were very, so to say, rigorous in, in, their, um, in their hypothesis and in their, um, in their considerations. He has published more than 400 papers, original papers, and uh, is among the top one most cited scientist, uh, which, which really means a lot. Um, he is also awarded uh, several times or was awarded by, uh, by prizes for best teaching. And this has something to do with his really great ability to, to give very, um, I mean, very exciting lectures, uh, which, which are interesting to, to follow. And uh, so it's my particular pleasure that we start this afternoon with Lutz Jenke uh, speaking about sex and gender differences in cognition, neurophysiology and neuroanatomy. And Lutz, we are very much looking forward to your talk and I'm, I'm happy that you're here and, and, and share your research with us. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Katrin. That was a nice introduction. Thank you so much. Okay, so hello for me. Wait a second. So that's my presentation. I hope you can see that. So I have 50 minutes time. I start my timer here. I will present you a bit about what we currently know about sex gender differences in terms of cognitive, neuroanatomical and neurophysiological differences. So because I only have a limited time period here available, I will only pick up some main aspects which has been uncovered in the recent 20 years. So I will talk about 
uh, sex differences in cognition, neuroanatomy, and physiology. I will leave out everything what we know about hormones and other issues which are very important here. But before I'm going to start, I have to mention that sex and gender difference are really interesting for everybody. So if you are going to write a book about sex and gender differences, it's, it's quite sure that this book will become a bestseller worldwide. This is only an example of the many books which have been written about sex and gender differences. And all of them, what you see here, all of these books have become world bestsellers. So the latest books are from Luen Brizendine. She has wrote a book about female brain and the male brain, and that was actually a world bestseller. As I mentioned before, I'm not going to talk too much about hormones. That would uh, take approximately 10 to 15 minutes to give you an introduction, but we know actually that sex hormones are very important during maturation. They influence brain development. We know that. We know that from animal research. We also know that from human research. And they influence brain activation. I will come to that later on. And they also influence behavior, particularly during puberty. But most importantly, I'm going to talk about the sex differences in cognition. So this is a table which has originally been designed by Doreen Kimura. Doreen Kimura was one of the first neuropsychologists who has strongly worked on cognition in terms of sex differences. And these are some examples where men and women would differ particular. For example, you can see that men, for example, are supposed to be better in mental rotation tasks. They are supposed to be better in spatial processing. They are supposed to be better in general motor skills. Women, on the other hand, are thought to be better in perceptual speed. So, so they identify um, perception issues much quicker than males. They are better in perceptual comparison tasks. They are thought to be better in verbal fluency tasks. And they're also thought to be better in fine motor skills and so on and so on. The point is when you do a comprehensive meta-analysis of all studies which have been published trying to identify cognitive differences um, between the sexes, you have to use statistics like Cohen's D, this affects us, in order to compare the performance of men and women and to use this standardized difference measure. And one of the first who did that was uh, Professor Hyde from Boston. She did that in 2005. And meanwhile, we have a couple of further meta analysis. So I'm going to present you some findings of these meta analysis, which provide some quite interesting results. Here you see in this complicated looking figure, something very easy to comprehend. On the abscissa, you can see the effect sizes. This with the, which is a normalized difference between the performance of men and women. On the left, you can see quite a lot of psychological functions. And I have marked some important functions in red where you can see the effect sizes. You have to imagine an effect size of, let's say, larger than 0.8 is considered as being a large effect size. An effect size being smaller than 0.3 is considered to be more or less meaningless. What you see over here, you see large effect sizes where, where in functions where women outperform men. For example, that is something what we call openness to new experience. On the bottom, you see mental rotation where men are thought to outperform women. And you can see here the effect size, which has been found in the many studies which have been published on that topic, that, that this effect size is approximately in the range of 0.7, which is approximately the same effect size what we found for openness to new aspects where women are supposed to outperform men. In the middle, you can see multitasking. That is a task for many people Lay people believe that women are better than men. You can see all the meta analysis show actually no statistical significant um, effect size in that matter. So what, what do these effects sizes mean? For example, look at these uh, normal distributions. And I have designed these normal distributions in order to show what that means uh, to, um, to have an effect size of 0.7. 
for example, here for openness to experience. If you have an effect side of 0.7, that means that the two distributions of the performances of the women and men strongly overlap. You can see here on the top, you can see the mean of the performances which are making the peak of these normal distributions. And with an effect size of 0.7, and assuming that these performances are distributing normally, you can calculate a couple of additional statistics which are quite important. For example, with an effect size of 0.7, you have approximately 76% of women of the women group, which will be above the mean of the main group. Approximately 73% of the two groups, however, will overlap. So there is no difference between that. And there is a chance of approximately 69 or 70% that a person picked up randomly from one group, from the women group, for example, will have a higher score than a person picked up at random from the main group. What, what does that mean? So this is a quite large effect size. You get significant results, for example, even if you use only 20 or 30 subjects in each group. But Although this is the quite large effect size, that means there is a high overlap. So there are many men and women showing the same performance, even if this, this effect size is relatively large. And I'm picking up here this effect size for a psychological function, which is supposed to be one of the most strongest differences in terms of cognition. So this is thought to be a cognition where men are outperforming women quite strongly. Oh, sorry, the other way around. It's the openness for experience. And the same you have for the mental rotation. It's the other way around. This is a strong cognitive function where men are thought to outperform women. And here we have the same figure. We have the effect size of 0.7 and the same statistics uh, pertain to that here. So even if this, you have this strong um, difference, we have quite a lot of subjects where we have a kind of overlap. So that means, on the other hand, that's quite difficult to, to make a prediction on an individual subject basis. You can't say, well, there are, there's a strong difference, but you can't say, well, um, it's quite sure that women or men are better in this or that task. It's a statistical significant difference, difference with, with, I would say, no strong influence on the prediction of the individual behavior. And we, if you take all these psychological functions together, which have been studied so far in terms of trying to compare both sexes, then you can come to this mean effect size. The mean effect size across all psychological functions which have been studied so far and which have been published um, come to the conclusion that the mean effect size is 0 0.3. And you can imagine that this effect set is actually so, so small that it becomes meaningless for individual subjects. Well, that is actually the first take home message which I am presenting here. Sex differences in cognition are small, relatively small or even non-existent. And they are mostly exaggerated in scientific work due to different reasons. They are mostly exaggerated in the lame world, you know. Let's come to neuroanatomy. Well, you know, the, the issue of comparing the sexes with neuroanatomical measures had a quite long tradition. I have no time to present that here, but one of the main papers which have been cited quite frequently is a paper from the 70s of the last century, 1970, from a neuroanatomist which, uh, uh, whom uh, uh, Katrin well know. It's the De La Coste-Utamsin group. And this group, they published a paper with five corpus callosum measures of men and five corpus callosum measures of, of females. And this, these were 10 uh, measures taken, the 10 measures taken from post-mortem brands. And they made the claim that the female callosa would be larger at the splenium compared to the main. And based on this study with 10 subjects, um, many people believed, uh, even in the layman press, they believed that women would have a larger corpus callosum, tying both hemispheres strongly together and making the female brain working entirely differently, more symmetric compared to the male brain. 
But meanwhile, the, the picture is a bit different. So there are thousands of people which have been studied and we know that these anatomical differences are a bit more complicated. I'm showing you here a data of our own data bank of uh, more than 5,000 brands so far. And I'm presenting you here the effect sizes. So the, dif the, the standardized differences for different brain measures. FPV is four brain volume. White matter is uh, WM. ICV is intracranial volume. Gray matter is gray matter cortex. Then you have hippocampus volume, thalamus, amygdala, cerebellum, putamen, white matter of the cerebellum, caudatus, cerebral spinal fluid, corpus callosum, pallidum, accumbens. Nucleus accumbens. Here you have the effect sizes. And when you compare men and women, you can see that men are outperforming, uh, I would say, than uh, outperforming women. So they have a bit larger volume measures compared to, to women. And here you can see the effect sizes. The largest effect size is for four brain volume, summing up to an effect size of approximately point, um, 1.3. And you can see the smallest effect size you can find for the accumbens, which is approximately 0.1. So when you have a look at the basal ganglia, mostly the basal ganglia show up with small differences. And uh, well, let's come back to our picture, what, which I have shown you before. If you use this uh, picture in order to make a kind of pictorial presentation of the effect size, let's take the largest effect size, which we have found so far for four brain volume. You can see these overlapping distributions. And this means that approximately 90% of the main group will be above the mean of the women group. Well, that's quite large, but nevertheless, approximately 50% of the two groups will overlap in terms of the forebrain volume sizes. On the other hand, there is a chance of 82% that a person picked at random from the main group will have a higher score than the person picked up random of the women group. But anyway, there is a quite large overlap. And um, um, if you calculate the mean across all compartments, you sum up to a kind of effect size of 0.8. And that means uh, that approximately 69 or 70% of these measures are overlapping. I will not go too much into detail, but if you, for example, normalize these brain compartments to the size of the intracranial volume, and then you compare the normalized brain measures between men and women, and then you come up with effect sizes, which are very, very small. So they have actually, there is actually a quite a non-existing kind of gender or sex differences. What we see uh, instead is something very interesting. We know that actually from the, um, I would say, the beginning of the 1990s, if you, for example, scale the volume of the white matter and gray matter, independent of sex and gender, to the total brain volume. You can see that, for example, gray matter volume and white matter volume um, scale differently. For example, you can see here a kind of pro assumed proportional relationship between brain volume and let's say other brain volume measures. So that's a linear relationship. And uh, what we actually see in our data bank, we see that, for example, the volume of gray matter scales negatively in terms of the slope with brain volume. And white matter scales positively in terms of the slope with volume. That means um, the larger the brain becomes, the larger is the volume of the white matter. The smaller the brain is, um, um, smaller brains, they have actually the opposite. They, they show up with a kind of uh, different uh, relationship with a gray matter. So what does that mean? That does mean that the different sizes of the brain, total brain volume, are related to different scaling principles of the brain compartments. That's, that's a point, that's a problem for comparing female and male brains because on average, female brains show up with smaller brains. But we also have, as you have seen, quite a lot of, quite a lot of men with small brains, which are of the same size as the brains of the females. 
And we also see quite a lot of female brains, which, which are of the same size as the average male brain. So it's a bit complicated and too easy to binarize the groups, the female and the male group, because we have in, in both groups, men and women with different brain sizes. And we know from these kind of allometric scaling principles that the different brain compartments, in particular the white matter and the gray matter, that they scale differently to the brain size. Well, um, so the take home message here is the following. So we have moderate to strong sex gender differences with respect to anatomical measures, if we look at them absolutely. We have generally smaller sex differences for the basal ganglia when we looked absolutely at them. If we work with relative brain sizes, we have actually no sex differences. If you use the, the intracranial volume, all the sex differences are mostly gone. What we know from other studies, I don't know, I have time to talk about that any uh, more because uh, the time is over. Oh, I only have four minutes left. I see on my, 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 my clock, which is running ahead here. So we found a kind, quite a lot of gray matter densities in focal brain areas, mostly in women. So there is a higher packing density, obviously, in the female brain. But anyway, so. I would like to point out that it's not so easy to compare anatomically female and male brain, male brains. But let's come to at the end to some points uh, in terms of sex and gender differences in term, terms of uh, brain activations. So in the 90s of the last century, there have been many papers published trying to compare, for example, brain activations in terms of language processing and, and these things. And they picked up and they identified um, differences between men and women. For example, the early papers, they demonstrated that, for example, females would process language bilaterally while men would process language unilaterally. So, for example, this paper from the 19, uh, 1999 from Frost and uh, Jeff Binder, they have worked with a quite large subject group. And when working with larger groups, they identified that there are no sex differences in terms of lateralization in, um, of brain activations when people have to process uh, language functions. So the larger the samples become, the less are the differences in, in the gender and sex differences, which is quite interesting. And one of the reasons why we know that uh, these large uh, sample size studies do not demonstrate strong gender differences is related to hormonal influences. We know that in the former studies, um, the, the colleagues and the researchers picked up females who have been in different phases of their menstrual cycle. So the estrogen and the progesterone were differently concentrated in their blood due to their menstrual cycle phase. So, and we know actually that um, we know that uh, the estrogen concentration has a strong influence on brain activation. And the story is quite simple. The more estrogen uh, you have available in the blood, the brain activation and the blood flow is my, more dis distributed in the brain. You have more activation. And we also know that, uh, for example, progesterone, which is most um, um, frequently available in the second phase of the menstrual cycle, is, some, is a hormone which affects the communication between the both hemispheres. Obviously, it blocks the corpus callosum. So the inflammation transfer between both hemispheres is inhibited, the more progesterone you have. So these uh, points which I'm go I've made here should pinpoint and emphasize a bit the strong influence of the periodic fluctuation of the sex hormones, which also have a quite strong influence on brain activation and cognition. So let's summarize what I have mentioned here. This is the take home message. We have to be aware of the fact that sex and gender differences with respect to cognition are relatively small. And we also have to um, emphasize that these cognition differences are strongly, relatively strongly influenced by yeah, education, plasticity, and cultural backgrounds. 
And in brain anatomy, we have uh, to acknowledge that the differences are influenced by brain size and by a lot of other things, allometric scaling and so on. And with respect to neurophysiology, physiology, we have also to acknowledge that the influence of the periodic fluctuation of the hormones is also very important. And finally, and that's my last word, we have to keep in mind the human brain is a highly plastic organ. It changes its anatomy and physiology due to experience strongly, really strongly. And I think many of the sex differences we are aware of are also anatomically and neurophysiologically influenced by individual influences. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Lutz. This was a very nice introduction and and it showed really how so to say how, how different perspectives have to brought have to uh, together in, in order to come to a comprehensive understanding of what sex and gender differences mean and um, having said that i would like to um, announce uh, our next speaker and um, this is francis catherine Krivenko. And when when you read her, her CV, it's it's amazing uh, how broad her experience uh, is. And uh, Frances Catherine is uh, from the Women's Brain Project, which is a, a non uh, uh, an NGO, non governmental uh, organization. Uh, she studied psychology in London at the University College, and then at the Imperial College, then uh, worked, as, uh, then worked uh, in, in Singapore University for a time and moved to uh, Robert Nitsch's lab in Zurich again, where she did uh, parts of her CV, uh, of her part of her uh, PhD, sorry. And uh, here she was very much interested in exploring preclinical Alzheimer's disease biomarkers using also neuroimaging techniques. And um, I think this was uh, an important uh, basis also for her next um, step in career. And that is she became an international medical manager uh, position at Roche Diagnostics. And uh, here also she was involved uh, in establishing um, uh, the value of timely biomarker based diagnostic in the field of Alzheimer's disease. And we know that Alzheimer uh, has uh, differences when you have a look, for example, to the point where when, when people get Alzheimer. And, and the question is why, why this is a case. And uh, we also assume um, that, that there are uh, different factors that interact with each other. And um, the question how relevant such factors as Lutz Jenke has described are for clinical purposes, for diagnosis, for but also for therapy. Uh, I mean, this is most important. And, and at the end, uh, we do not want to develop only drugs uh, for, for a certain part of the population, but we want to consider how, how drugs are acting uh, on, on a female or on a male organism and, and also understand what the risk factors are. So I'm I'm very much looking forward uh, to our second speaker, to, to Frances Catherine, and, um, and listening uh, to her talk um, about sex and gender and Alzheimer's disease and the Women's Brain Project. Thank you very much for coming and presenting. Thank you very much for the introduction, uh, Katrin. And, um, it was a very interesting topic to hear from Professor Jenke. Um, again, very much believe that we should always look at things critically. I'll be coming at this presentation with a bit more of a, a different outlook. So since we don't have too much time, I'll try to provide as much of a snapshot as I can of um, sex and gender differences in different biological variables in the brain and mental diseases, taking a certain examples as well. Um, hold on. Sorry and then going into the Women's Brain Project as well. So before I proceed, just wanted to emphasize that um, uh, my disclosures, I am an employee at Roche Diagnostics. However, what I'm reflecting is our work at the Women's Brain Project and also some of my own personal opinions. So to briefly summarize, almost all brain and mental diseases seem to present a sex bias. 
So there's female biased illnesses as well as male biased illnesses. Some of the most prominent in the female sex section are Alzheimer's disease, as uh, Katun also mentioned before. And there's also depression, anxiety, migraine, and traumatic brain injury. More recently also, there's um, a lot of evidence pointing towards long COVID also being more um, towards female bias. There's also then uh, male biased illnesses as well, which include um, uh, diseases such as Parkinson's disease, ALS, and midlife stroke. So this in itself already pro provides a snapshot picture of there being a bit of a disparity between the two sexes. So however, it's not just about the incidence and the prevalence of the different diseases, but there is also different points and milestones that would affect an individual that are affected by sex and gender. For example, risk factors for certain diseases, some males or females are more prone to one or the other, differences in terms of biomarkers, so biological markers of disease, symptomology, um, there's also, especially in, in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, differences in terms of progression, um, responses to drugs, and uh, treatment adherence. And this all um, affects you know, prevention, diagnosis, as well as subsequent treatment and the selection, recruitment, as well as execution of clinical trials. And these are all a big complex picture in which sex and gender could play a very significant role. So there are many different reasons behind the sex and gender differences in brain disorders. Um, so, you know, there's epigenetics and um, hormones, as Professor Yanka mentioned in his presentation. There's genetics as well, um, connectomy and bias. So there's many different reasons for um, these potential differences that have arisen and that we do observe. So just to provide um, another example, there's also differences in Parkinson's disease. So what is a potential difference? So there's this very nice infographic here, which show um, differences in symptomology. So symptomology that is more prevalent in female patients, for example, are the tremor and the pain. Um, there's an overlap here as well in both, um, such as mild cognitive impairment. But for example, with males, there's also executive functioning deficits or the freezing of gait, which is more prominent in male patients. And also to tie into the, the point that was brought in the, um, about the menstrual cycle, sorry, my slides are moving without me. <laughs> um, young female patients also show to have um, fluctuations in their symptoms depending on their menstrual cycle as well. So these are factors that need to be taken into consideration. There's also um, a large heterogeneity in neurology and psychiatry as a whole. So for example, there are clinical symptoms that are quite similar although there may be a different underlying pathology. So for example, there's depression and cognitive decline, but maybe the reasons for this occurring could be wildly different between males and females. Then there is also pathological mechanisms. So on the flip side, the pathological mechanisms that are maybe common in both, however, different symptoms are found. So sex differences could be a potential driver of this disease heterogeneity. And so, there may be a need for biomarkers as a specific indicator of the disease and for these biomarkers to take into account sex and gender. So offering more in this snapshot, there's also diagnosis as well, where this is a very big question. And this speaks very much to what I've been working on in the past couple of years. So time to diagnosis is quite long for several neurodegenerative diseases, as you can see them summarized here. They take about one to two years. And one of the reasons could potentially be because there's a lack of personalized medicine, lack of personalized care. And this leads into misdiagnosis, delayed diagnosis. And as I had pointed out, there might be a need to have more sex and gender specific biomarkers, for example, for certain diseases. So the overarching goal would then be to move from what is called shallow medicine, so what the standard care is right now, to precision medicine. So there was this summary in, in, in Nature where they found that for every person that drugs actually help with, the 10 highest selling drugs in the US do fail to improve the conditions of around three to 24 people. So those people marked in red, and they're categorized here according to the different drugs. So what's quite prominent about this and what the main takeaway message of this article was, is what we need to focus on more is to tailor treatment 
to the individual itself and to take into account variables such as sex and gender and not to have a one size fits all type solution. And this could potentially improve care. So for example, we published a case study in Alzheimer's disease in the WAM report. So this was the Women's Brain Project where they investigated it under the sex and gender lens. So we looked at prevalence, of course, um, two thirds of uh, patients are women, 65% of deaths are also female, and 70% of carer hours are also female. So very striking um, bias towards the female side, for example, in Alzheimer's disease. Then um, another case study, again, tying into Alzheimer's diseases, this is something that we've mainly been looking at in early on in the Women's Brain Project. Um, we found that like, women do represent the majority of patients with Alzheimer's disease, as you saw two thirds, as well as other related dementias. So this is around 68.2% and 62.1% of patients in Europe and US. Um, the sex differences occur in disease symptoms in, and in disease progression, as well as the different biomarkers. So we've listed um, several papers here on this slide, which you can see on the right where you can see there's uh, differences in um, the occurrence of the APOEE4 genetic risk genotype, um, also differences in the accumulation rate of tau aggregates, um, as well as um, sex-specific norms for verbal memory tests. There's also um, marginal differences that were observed in this um, study here. Uh, so, also, just to direct uh, another publication where we've summarized all of this in a bit more detail is um, a publication done with uh, Carla Abdulnur um, in, Bar um, in Barcelona, uh, where we published sex and gender differences in Alzheimer's disease in a, in a book. Um, I would invite you to check this out, especially since we don't have too much time to delve into the many different studies here. Um, and then lastly, what I'd also like to point out is another paper that we had recently published where we looked at the proportion of women, as well as the reporting of the outcomes of uh, sex in clinical trials for Alzheimer's disease. So this was a systematic review and meta-analysis done by the Women's Brain Project. Um, so it was quite interesting. The findings that we had was only 12.5% of publications um, that were included in the meta-analysis reported sex stratified results. Um, we also saw that um, these random clinical trials included less women than what was expected, so it didn't reflect what AD, um, so the Alzheimer's disease epidemiology actually reflects, um, and this is um, in particular with um, clinical trials that have already approved drugs. Um, there was a proportion of women enrolled um, on average, but there was also an effect of pre-specified variables, so of course um, screening fail. Um, however, again, I won't go into too much detail into this just to save a bit of time. Um, and then another uh, part of the picture that I'd like to point out is, of course, we've been speaking about biomarkers, diagnosis, clinical treatment, but then there's disruptive technologies such as digital solutions and digital biomarkers, which could potentially be a solution in terms of addressing sex and gender differences in brain disorders. So it could be that algorithms could then be trained to account for these biases and could perhaps circumvent exacerbating these biases. So this is looking into the future and really trying to look at the potential of these disruptive technologies and how they can be used to, um, to uh, improve the standard of care as we have today. And uh, I'll skip over this slide just as a, a nice um, kind of infographic of what I've been trying to demonstrate. And then the last part of the talk that I would like to address, so this um, little bit would just be to speak about the Women's Brain Project. So I tried to just provide a very broad snapshot of what has been observed in the literature, um, also some publications that we've had ourselves. So the Women's Brain Project, and thanks again, Katrin, for the very nice introduction. So they were um, an NGO where there's a clear purpose to transform the view on brain and mental disease. So it started out as a group of scientists from different disciplines. So we have medical doctors, neuroscientists, psychologists, 
um, and those who also work in other functions such as communications and we work together with caregivers, patients and their relatives and other stakeholders such as policymakers and stakeholders. And the aim is to improve the state of medical treatments and drug development for brain and mental health by taking into account sex and gender differences and to look at this as a gateway towards precision medicine. So moving from this shallow medicine to personalized medicine in that slide that I highlighted before. Um, and so we have different strategic objectives and different ways of achieving them. So um, quite a lot of broad ambitious projects. So we try to generate evidence um, and to interpret this evidence as well to support the, the hypotheses that we do have. Um, the Women's Brain Project also has quite a lot of experts that are um, uh, on sex and gender influences on health um, and are happy to collaborate and also consult. Then also um, uh, one objective is our awareness. So uh, the Women's Brain Project really likes to uh, raise the profile of sex and gender differences and the impact that this could have amongst um, our, our daily stakeholders, the, the daily person, as well as you know, um, healthcare as a whole. And so how we'd like to achieve it is to have a precision medicine institute for brain and mental health disease. And we focus with on research and consult on um, existing data sets from clinical trials. Um, and that's some of the things that we do um, try to do. And just to show again, this is a picture of the team. Um, there's quite a number of us, I think several are missing as well. Um, and just to go over very quickly some of the projects that we have done at the Women's Brain Project to try and address um, the different issues and gaps that I brought up in the previous slides is, you know, we've published several scientific papers and I'm happy to refer you to them as well as some books and policy reports. We're also present at certain events. So we've had, um, a global forum on women's brain and mental health, um, and then the Emozioni forum as well. There's also teaching and outreach that the Women's Brain Project does, so lectures and talks, as well as um, some CME accredited courses and many different international collaborations, and as well as a regulatory roundtable um, and some awareness campaigns that we work on as well. And this is just a, a brief slide summarizing all the different engagements that we do have. And again, not to go into too much detail, just to go over the different um, recognitions that we've had and collaborations and um, media presence that the Women's Brain Project has had, just to summarize how engaged the team is and to trying to especially raise awareness about the issue and the potential impact that it does have on clinical care. So, um, this is kind of a, again, a summary from how we want to move from shallow medicine to precision medicine and sustainability. So the outcomes of potentially taking into account sex and gender differences could help influence and inform certain stakeholders to increase you know, efficacy of the drug. So for example, in the slide where we saw that several drugs were not effective, it could be because it didn't take into account certain individual needs, especially variables that are as simple as sex and gender. Also improving drug safety profiles. Um, that's also something that could be impacted very heavily by sex and gender, as well as an increase to the adherence to therapy, as well as the compliance to the therapy. And then hopefully also reducing costs that then are associated to the failure of drugs, which again might arise because sex and gender were not taken into account when looking at the efficacy of the drug. And so our call to action is to look at four um, different main points. So the first is to analyze sex differences in baseline patient characteristics to look really at the progression of the disease clinical outcomes um, and this in different contexts. So digital biomarkers, fluid biomarkers, very um, different parts of the field. Again, speaking to um, the different slides that I've gone over before, raising this awareness of sex and gender differences, especially amongst the scientific community. I, I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted here in this, in this webinar, but um, what we really try to do is speak really to the different studies, the evidences that show these differences, um, 
not just to the scientific community, but try to broaden this as a whole to reach out to those uh, pharmaceutical and technological industries as well as uh, policymakers as well as the general public. And then to potentially implement solutions that do derive out of certain studies that have been done in the past, such as implementing algorithms um, for data analysis or drug development to detect these biases and, and to circumvent this, the, such as the disruptive technologies that I've spoken about before. And then also to incorporate these key ethical considerations in every stage of technological development um, and to ensure that the systems do maximize the well-being and the health of the global population by taking into account variables such as sex and gender. And uh, so with this, I'd like to conclude my talk to thank you all very much for your time and to congratulate the prize winners as well. So now I would say um, we, we come to the or we, we come to the highlight uh, of this webinar and, and also the motivation. Uh, of, of having this webinar. Can you go to the next slide, please? That's the Diversity and Research Paper Award. And um, it was invented, it was set up in order to honor uh, excellent scientific achievement, which consider diversity traits in neuroscience and related fields. And the last question that we touched uh, is precisely, so to say, one of the reasons uh, we want to learn more uh, about uh, the mechanisms that are behind different sexual behavior, yeah, uh, different cognitive behavior. And uh, we wanted to encourage everybody in the Human Brain Project and, and also in the European and US and in other communities uh, to, to address this research question uh, with, uh, with scientific tools. And then to highlight uh, two papers uh, that did it in a particular um, impressive way. So can you go to the next slide, please? Who is we? And uh, in the Human Brain Project, uh, we have uh, a diversity and equal opportunity committee. And you have uh, met earlier Karin Grasenik, who really uh, initiated this, uh, this work and, and this committee, but you see here uh, that there are many, many more people involved in this activity and in particular Andrea Alonso Allende and, and Benjamin Weyers, they are chairing this um, the diversity and equal opportunities committee and there are many scientists from all disciplines, from all levels of career, I would say, who are contributing. And you have here an overview of who is behind this, uh, this diversity and equal opportunity committee. Next, please. And when, when we started these discussions about the, uh, the prize, uh, one of the first uh, steps was, of course, to identify criteria that help us uh, to to estimate what are the best papers and uh, uh, who are the winners. And uh, the, the criteria are listed here. So we wanted to have the paper open access. Uh, we had to look to theory and methods, and this was weighted with, with 50%. Um, then the question was how interdisciplinary this approach is because the original assumption was that that such question like sex and gender it cannot be restricted to one discipline uh, it is probably necessary a collaboration coming uh, from from people coming from different disciplines and there is an overall quality so this is what we agreed uh, at the very beginning next please and then so to say uh, two winners uh, have been selected, and it's my real pleasure now to come to the first winner, which is Sanne Peters. Um, she has been recognized for her outstanding contribution to diversity research with a paper published by her and colleagues uh, with the title Sex Differences in the Association Between Major Risk Factors and the Risk of Stroke in the UK Biobank Cohort Study. And uh, this is, so to say, also uh, a physical paper that we will hand over to her, but we see it here now. And uh, it's, uh, it's a work, it's a scientific study that is really based on a very large number of subjects. Uh, the UK Biobank is really one of the most important uh, cohort resources, including neuroimaging data, 
but also genetic data, behavioral data, and, and, and many, many others. So if you have not um, came across, uh, have a look. I mean, this is really a great uh, study where you can address your own research questions. And uh, so did Sanne. So Sanne is uh, from the George Institute for Global Health. Uh, she's the associate professor at this institute and a senior lecturer uh, at the Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College. Uh, London, but she also holds uh, a joint uh, appointment associate professor of the University Medical Center in Utrecht. Um, she obtained her PhD in epidemiolo uh, epidemiology from Utrecht University and worked as a postdoc uh, there and at the University of Cambridge and the University of Oxford. And her research focuses on sex differences in the prevention, presentation, management, and outcomes of chronic diseases, mainly cardiovascular and diabetes. And she has already um, received several prestigious grants and fellowships, including a four-year strategic skills development fellowship from UK Medical Research Council and a five-year fellowship from the Dutch Research Council. So that's really amazing. And um, she is uh, also the specialty chief editor for sex and gender differences in disease in the Frontiers in Global Women's Health Journal. And her paper now, uh, which was awarded, is based on a very large sample of the UK Biobank participating. And her research topic was to examine the predictiveness of risk factors for stroke types in a longitudinal way. And she found out that the risk factors uh, are a little bit different between males and females. And uh, for example, diabetes is one of the factors uh, that is uh, interacting with sex uh, in, a, in a very specific way. So this, I would say, joins or connects to what we heard from, from Francis, that indeed these uh, sex and gender differences have a very clear impact on medicine and uh, we should better understand um, what the precise uh, interactions were, where in order to better prevent and to exclude, for example, risk factors in one or the, the other sex, uh, but also to develop therapies. So it's my really big pleasure now to introduce and uh, to welcome the first uh, of our winners, which is uh, Sanne. And uh, I would like to hand over to you uh, to give your presentation uh, on this topic. So congratulations from, from my side and from everybody here uh, in the webinar. And uh, we are very curious and looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Catherine, for this very kind introduction. And I'm very pleased, of course, um, by having been awarded this, uh, this very prestigious uh, award. Um, and very pleased to be part of this uh, this webinar. I've really enjoyed uh, the presentation so far. Um, you can hear me well and you can see my slides, right? Um, yes. Okay, just checking. Um, all right, so I'm indeed going to present uh, our research uh, on sex differences and risk factors uh, for stroke. I've been working in the field of sex differences um, uh, for the past uh, decade, so I, but I, for this uh, presentation, I will try to restrict myself to this particular paper. Um, Anyway, I have nothing to declare. Um, as, um, but as, as a starters, I would like to, you see, okay, my thing here. Um, as a starters, I would like to um, start with, with, uh, with, with known sex differences in the presentation of cardiovascular disease, because um, it's still often perceived that cardiovascular disease is a disease that mainly affects men. And while, while it is true that uh, men on average uh, tend to develop heart disease about five to 10 years um, uh, earlier than, than women, um, it, uh, women are more likely to, 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 to get a stroke, which occurs slightly later in life. So in the, on the, in, in the figure on, uh, on, on this slide, you see indeed that in the, in the top panel, men uh, start to ha uh, have, have, have developed CHD at a, at a younger age, uh, whereas women, uh, from the age of 70 years onwards um, uh, have, a, have a much higher uh, rate of, uh, of, of stroke. And that's, of course, uh, what, I'm, what, what I'm going to study in this, um, this particular paper. Um, I've, together with my colleagues, have conducted a series of meta-analysis where we examined whether there were differences in the magnitude of the effect of risk factors for both stroke and heart disease. 
Um, and even though the main risk factors for stroke and heart disease are, are well, essentially identical for women and men, uh, the magnitude of the effect uh, for, is different for some risk factors. And Catherine already said, indeed, that uh, there's quite strong evidence that the magnitude of the effect of diabetes on the risk of both heart disease and stroke is stronger in women uh, as compared with men. And that's, that, that is also what you see on this slide. Um, even though the even though uh, diabetes is a risk factor for heart disease and stroke in both women and men, the magnitude of that effect is uh, stronger in women uh, as compared with men for both uh, heart disease and, and for stroke, particularly when you look for, uh, at type at type one diabetes, but also for type two diabetes. Um, the issues, however, with the uh, meta analysis that, that we had been that, that we that we had conducted, is that we hadn't been able to uh, look at the major uh, stroke subtypes. And as I think you all know, there's um, uh, major pa uh, pat uh, pathophysiological differences between uh, the major subtype being ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke. Um, given that we, ha we had to do meta analysis of published data, there was also huge heterogeneity between those studies in terms of design analysis and but also the populations that had been studied. Um, we also ha hadn't been able to compare the different risk factors directly, uh, so, that, so the adjustments that had been made in the, in the studies varied, um, um, also complicating comparability. Uh, furthermore, um, we haven't been able to, to, to conduct subgroup analysis, um, for example, by different age groups uh, and also not uh, by socioeconomic status, even though there's increasing awareness of, um, you know, the, uh, the, the importance of intersectionality also in sex differences research. And uh, finally, um, the sex differences in risk factor associations hadn't been put into the context of sex differences and absolute risks. And I'll come to that uh, in a minute. So this is a background. Um, uh, and with, of course, the huge opportunities uh, offered by the UK Biobank, we decided to um, address all these issues in, a, in the UK Biobank. So even though the UK Biobank has already, has already been mentioned a couple of times in this, uh, in this webinar, I'll just briefly uh, present it here. So the UK Biobank is a large um, prospective cohort study conducted in the UK, um, so in England, Wales and Scotland. Um, it includes about half a million uh, men and women uh, who are aged between 40 and 17 years at base, baseline and study baseline was, in, was between 26 and 2010. A lot of extensive measurements uh, were done, um, and importantly, the people uh, had also been have also been followed prospectively for uh, for health outcomes. Um, so this is just a sort of like a, a, a visual abstract of the of the study that we conducted. So, as uh, Catherine already said, we aim to study um, the sex differences in the potential sex differences in the associations between various risk factors and the risk uh, of, of, of stroke, um, including uh, the, the major stroke subtypes. For that, uh, to do that, uh, we used um, data on uh, 470,000 individuals in the UK Biobank without a previous history of cardiovascular disease. Um, we had nine years of follow-up, and within those nine years, uh, about uh, 4,600 people uh, had developed um, stroke, um, and 56% 50, 50, of those uh, cases were men, and 44% of those cases were women. Um, what we found is, is, uh, is that the incidence rate of uh, stroke was higher um, in men as compared with women, um, uh, and it was mainly the case for ischemic stroke and less, uh, and less the case for, for hemorrhagic stroke. But hemorrhagic stroke was also uh, less uh, um, frequent uh, overall um, as compared with ischemic. But that's, of course, um, which, well, what is expected based upon the prevalence and incidence of those uh, conditions. So this is consistent what, what you, with what you would expect. Um, so in terms of uh, risk factors for, for stroke, we found that uh, for ischemic stroke, the, strongest risk, the strong risk factors were um, AF, so atrial fibrillation, diabetes, and smoking. Uh, but we also found associations uh, between, uh, between hypertension, obesity, socioeconomic status, and ischemic stroke. And also consistent with prior knowledge, uh, high, high cholesterol was not, somewhat, was not really associated with, with ischemic stroke. For hemorrhagic stroke, we again found a very strong association between AF and hemorrhagic stroke. And we also found a very strong association between hypertension and hemorrhagic stroke. We also found associations be between smoking 
uh, diabetes uh, and hemorrhagic stroke and no associations between high cholesterol, obesity, and low, low socioeconomic status with hemorrhagic, with hemorrhagic stroke. And this was um, the case for both women and men. Uh, I'll now move into uh, um, uh, the quantification of the sex differences because we conducted the analysis separately for women and men, but we also uh, included an interaction term between uh, sex and the risk factor of interest in the model. So to be able to quantify the sex differences. So we obtained the, uh, the, the hazard ratio. So the, uh, the results from the effect sizes from a survival from a Cox regression model. Um, and we calculated the ratio of the hazard ratios. And we used um, 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 men as the reference. So, the, so we calculated women to men has ratios of, of, of hazard ratios. For um, and so um, hazard ratios of hazard ratios greater than one indicate that the um, hazard ratio was greater in women as compared uh, with men. Um, as you can see here, uh, we didn't find a uh, sex difference in the association between any of the blood pressure markers and ischemic stroke. However, when we looked at categorization of, uh, uh, of hypertension, uh, we found uh, that, that uh, stage one and stage two hypertension were more strongly associated with ischemic stroke in women as compared with men. Um, and we also found um, evidence uh, towards uh, a greater association for hemorrhagic stroke in women as compared with men. Um, for smoking, um, uh, we didn't find evidence uh, for differences in the in the association between smoking and either of the either of the stroke subtypes. Um, we, however, found that uh, obesity was associated was associated more strongly with uh, the risk of ischemic stroke in women as compared to men. So you can interpret this as um, that the risk of of uh, ischemic stroke associated with uh, with obesity was thirty six percent greater in women as compared uh, with men. Um, for um, atrial fibrillation, we found that uh, that that women uh, that uh, with AF are much um, more strongly affected by hemorrhagic stroke as compared uh, with uh, men with uh, AF as compared to those uh, without AF. So the risk, the hazard ratio for uh, uh, for hemorrhagic stroke uh, associated with AF was much stronger in women as compared with men. And for socioeconomic status, we found some evidence uh, of a stronger association um, in women as compared with men. Um, putting, this, uh, putting these results into the context of absolute rates, as already mentioned, men uh, had, higher, um, uh, had a higher incidence of, uh, of, of stroke in women, sorry, uh, as compared with women. So, having, so even though we found evidence for stronger relative risks in women as compared with men, men uh, still uh, had a higher absolute rate um, uh, of any stroke, but also of ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke, even in the presence of, uh, of risk factors that convert a greater relative risk. So women at best um, um, catch up with men when they are exposed to certain risk factors, in particular AF. Um, so that is also the conclusion of uh, my presentation, even though the, the incidence of stroke is higher, uh, in men, some risk factors are more strongly associated with stroke risk in women. Um, and uh, the mechanisms underpinning these sex differences uh, weren't for the study because that's not we, that, that is not what we studied in uh, this particular analysis. I would like to close with that and I would like to very thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Zana. This, this was a great talk. And uh, I think that participants got an impression how much work is behind, how carefully you have to analyze the data in, in order to get such results. And uh, it was certainly, it's a true prize winner. Congratulations from, from me again. And then last but not least, we have a second prize winner. And um, that is, um, the second prize goes to Yi Zhang. And he did the paper, uh, the human brain is best described as being on a female male continuum, evidence from a new imaging connectivity study. This is a very interesting paper uh, because uh, it addresses a research question that has not yet been so much uh, addressed uh, in the past. And uh, this is really amazing to see because Yi Zhang is uh, now a postdoc, but he finished his PhD only last year at Shanghai Center for Mathematical Sciences at Fudan University. 
So now he works uh, mainly on resting state and TAS fMI, EG, MEG neuroimaging data uh, analysis, and he is using machine learning to study sex and gender differences to identify uh, the patterns. And this also helped him to carry out this study, which addresses the issue of psychological and brain androgyny, focusing on different variables, that is sex, age, their mutual connections, years after the menopause for female subjects. And uh, it brings into uh, connection the uh, behavioral data um, that are, so to say, uh, seen uh, as a behavioral level, uh, a kind of continuum between uh, males and females and, um, and, and, uh, and, and imaging data. So uh, we will hear now more about it. We have um, now uh, 10 minutes for you, uh, Yi Zhang. And everybody, please prepare the final round of questions. We will have uh, at the end, hopefully 10 minutes. And the floor is open for questions uh, to anybody here who presented. But now we are looking forward to our second prize winner. And please accept our uh, sincere congratulations to this, uh, to this prize and uh, looking forward to, to listen to your talk. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And uh, it is a great honor of me to receive such an award. Okay, so uh, hello, I am Ija and I am a postdoctoral researcher of the Institute of Science and Technology for Brain Spider Intelligence and the Center for Computational Psychiatry at Fudan University. And also, I am currently a visiting researcher of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge. Um, today, I'm very glad to be here to introduce my previous work on brain androgyny. Uh, early last year, we published our study in the journal Cerebral Codex as well as the conversation. We found that rather than being classified as female or a male, the brain sex spanned on a continuum from the extreme female end to androgynous section and then to the extreme male end. In the large sample with more than 8,000 subjects, we found that many people had an androgynous brain rather than an extreme female or male brain. About 50% of the brains were classified as androgynous brains because they were located in the middle part of the sex continuum, while one quarter were classified at the female end and the remaining quarter were classified at the male end. We also discovered that individuals with androgynous brains had better mental health, especially fewer internalizing symptoms, including lower anxiety and withdrawing behavior. Uh, our study was carried out on functional magnetic resonance image, which is abbreviated as fMRI. The signal of oxygenated blood flow, which we called the BOLT signal, was measured to reflect the neuronal activity. Higher signal indicates higher activity. In our study, we analyzed the whole brain, which was parcelated into around 100 brain regions. Here is the BOLT signal of two brain regions as an example. The angular gyrus located in the posterior part of the brain, while the inferior orbital frontal cortex located in the anterior part of the brain. The bolt signal fluctuated over time in those brain regions. As we can see from those figures, the activity of those two different regions had some degree of synchronism, which means they often rise or drop at the same time. We use the so-called correlation coefficient to measure such degree of synchronism. Here, the angular gyrus and the inferior frontal, orbital frontal cortex had a correlation coefficient of 0.57, indicating a medium degree of synchrony between those two regions. Calculating each pair of the functional connectivity between brain regions, we could finally derive the functional connectivity network, that is the matrix here, which was used in our classifications. The angular gyrus and the inferior orbital frontal cortex both belong to a specific brain network called the default mode network as highlighted here. In our study, when classifying the brain functional network into a female or a male group, 
We found that the default mode network contributed most to the classification accuracy. The default mode network was also involved in many psychiatric disorders, such as depression, anxiety, and especially the internalizing symptoms, such as ruminations. We used an AI machine learning algorithm to construct the stacks continuum. The brain functional network of a total of more than 8,000 participants were used as the input of the model one by one. Here, we put the brain functional network of the first subject into our model. We found that the brain functional network of the first participant was an example of an extreme female brain. The brain functional network of this participant was 85% like a female brain, while 15% like a male brain. So the brain sex of this subject located in the extreme female end of the continuum. Similarly, we use the second subject as an input. And we found that the second participant had an extreme male brain, which was 11% like a female brain while 89% like a male brain. So the brain sex of this participant located in the extreme male end of the continuum. Repeating that process for all 8,119 subjects, we could have the sex continuum for each of those subjects. Here, the last participant had an androgynous brain which was 48% like a female brain, while 52% like a male brain. The brain sex of this participant located in the androgynous section of the continuum. After, after analyzing over 8,100 brain functional networks, we found that about half of the brains were classified as androgynous while the other two quarters were classified as the female or male end of the continuum. The brain sex continuums change with age, especially in females. The increase of the years after menopause was associated with the shift of the brain sex continuum away from female end, indicating that the brain sex continuum might be related to sex hormones. We further studied the association between brain androgyny and internalizing symptoms. Internalizing symptoms are inner directed and are always associated with anxiety, withdrawal, and many other depression-related behaviors. Finally, we found that people with androgynous brains have lower psychiatric symptoms. More specifically, people with brain sex located in the middle section of the continuum tended to have lower internalizing symptoms compared with those located on two extreme ends. As a conclusion, in our study, Based on the sex differences in the brain, we could build a reliable machine learning model to define the brain sex continuum. Using the brain sex continuum, we find that brain androgyny was associated with less internalizing symptoms. These findings support our novel hypothesis that there exists a neuroimage concept of brain androgyny, which may be associated with better mental health in a similar way to psychological androgyny. Given that we have found that an androgynous brain offers better mental health, it follows that for optimal performance in school and work and for better well-being throughout life, we need to avoid extreme stereotypes and offer children and adolescents opportunities not restricted by their biological sex as they grow up. The core authors of this article include Professor Jen Feng Feng and Dr. Chang Luo from Fudan University, and Professor Barbara Sahakian, Professor Ed Bumo, and Dr. Crystal Landy, and others include those from the European Imaging Cohort and the Yangming University. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Li. This was an exciting talk, very interesting. Thank you very much uh, to the speakers, to the prize winners. Thank you very much, Karin, uh, Julia, and the whole team uh, of, the, of the committee.
to you who participated and who made it interesting. And I hope that we meet uh, again in, in this round uh, in the near future. So thank you very much for attending and uh, let's continue on, on studying sex and gender uh, and what does it mean for the brain and brain function. Thank you. <laughs>